Well, hey, good morning. Good to see everyone today. Hey, let's celebrate. We made it. We're in church. So good to see you. This is the third week of a series called Once for All, and we're going to wrap it up today. And uh, you can catch the first couple of weeks online if you want to. But would you just take a moment and let's pray together. Jesus, we believe that you want to speak to us today through your word. And we declare together, you are good. Jesus, you are good. Would you just say that out loud? Just say it. Jesus, you are good. (laughs) Jesus, you are good. You have been good to us. You've shown us goodness. And now, God, would you show us more goodness even through your word? We open our minds and hearts to receive from you today, God. I pray that whoever came today hurting would receive a touch from heaven for the hurt to be healed. God, I pray that whoever came today needing an answer, that God, today you would speak by the Spirit and the answer would come. Lord, I pray for whoever is here today who needs comfort. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to come alongside and allow comfort to flow even while someone's just here today. God, I pray for somebody who's here today who needs friendships. Lord, I pray that today you'd give some of uh, the other brothers and sisters in this place eyes to see who might just simply need a friend. And God, I pray that you'd speak to each one of us in a way that would allow us to, to take thoughts captive and make them obedient to Jesus so that we can live for the glory of your name. And all God's people shout together, amen. amen. Oh, no, no, all God's people shout together. Amen. Okay, that's a little better. I was hoping to hear a shout. Okay, amen, amen. So uh, you know what? That's a pretty good deal. I just want to say, brother, good morning. Okay. So every once in a while, we just got to recognize we have, you know, we have a lot of people who, say, who speak Spanish as a native language. So I love it that David was leading us just a little bit and speaking Spanish. And then, and then we have a, a deaf community that we get to gather with. And every once in a while, maybe it would do us well to learn a little bit uh, and color, color outside of the lines that we're used to in terms of how we communicate. So this is, by the way, can I just teach you something? In the deaf community, it, to, to show the praise you, what you do is you lift your hands and just do like this. You just go, this is like shouting hallelujah, right? So we're with you, huh? Okay, amen. Oh, amen. Come on, let's, let's all learn that. This one's fun, right? You take it like this, you just go, amen. Yeah, amen. Pastor Rene taught me that. Amen. Okay, so uh, I want to get into the message. That was a little bit fun, but hey. So a few weeks ago, I had a, a, an experience I've never had in my life. I'm guessing that a lot of you have had this experience, and you can relate to what I'm about to share, but this is what happened to me. So I had to get a, a vision test from an eye doctor in order to get clearance to start taking this medication. And so I'd never gone to an eye doctor, ever. I mean, I'd have my eyes checked at the regular doc, and that was about it years ago. But uh, I had to get uh, the real eye doc, and so it's a very unfamiliar experience to me. But I walked in and, and, and they, they got me situated and the, and the gal took me back and did the, the different tests and whatnot and then took me over to this other office and, and then the doc came in, the eye doc came in and lo and behold, he's like, hello, Pastor John. <laughs> it was the center point guy, which is comforting. That's good. Uh, and, and maybe a little awkward too, <laughs> but because he's right up close. But but uh, he, he said, well, so, you know, tell me, you, you, you got here today, you drove in, uh, no, no problems driving, and you, you don't have any glasses, so you, you, you feel you're probably doing pretty good, right? And I was like, yeah, I think I'm doing pretty good. I mean, 2020, right? And he said, yeah, no, not exactly. <laughs> and, you know, to be fair, I had noticed in the last number of months or whatnot that I've been doing a little bit of this, you know, here and there, and I just figured that's because they printed it with too small of a font. That's because the lights aren't bright enough. That's because, you know, the, the screen is too dim. I mean, it's all that. It, it's not me, you know? <laughs> anyway, he said, well, yeah, yeah, you're not exactly 2020, but let, let me just show you something. I mean, he said, you don't actually have to get glasses. You don't have to. No one's going to make you do it. But, but let me just show you. You know, you thought you were 2020. You're not. He said, let me show you what, uh, what it would look like. And he, put, he did that thing with all of the different lenses and dialed me back in on that. And, and he showed me. He's like, this is your current vision, how it currently is. I'm like, yeah, exactly. And, and I could read that third row. I could do it. I mean, it was a little fuzzy, but I could try just right. And I got it. I aced that test. I won. Like, victory. I won. And he said, yeah, that's your regular test. Now, watch this. He put the 20. He's like, this is 2020. I can see every single letter, every line square and crisp and clean. And, and, and uh, he said, now, so what do you think of that? I said, sir, give me those glasses. So that's what I said. <laughs> And so for the first time in my life, yes, I did. I got the glasses, and I'm pretty, pretty excited about having them. So get used to the new me. Huh. 
But guess what? Listen, all y'all in the back, you thought I couldn't see you. I can see you perfectly now. I know when you're actually reading the Bible or when you're texting your friends. I can see you. I got you. Yeah. But I got these glasses, and these ones are, are, are great because the bottom part is for reading, and then the top part is for distance. So if you see me doing like this, it's not because I agree with you. I'm just, trying, I'm just going between the two different parts of my glasses and trying to get used to it. Here. But I, So I got these new glasses, and the moment I put them on, I, I, can, I can totally see so much more clearly. I can see differently than I ever saw before with so much crisp definition and, and, and such clean edges and, and, and with clarity. And this is an analogy. I'm going to use this as an analogy today. When you believe in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ and the miraculous, victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, they become like lenses that you put on. And when you put on the lenses of faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus, you are able to see things that you never could see clearly before. You are able to understand the reality as you are intended in the spirit to see it and experience the reality. And I am praying today that you and I would put on our spiritual lenses and see clearly the death and resurrection of Jesus and what it means and why it matters to you. So... I want you to think about the scriptures, Romans 6.10. Romans 6.10 says this. We looked at it three weeks ago on Easter, but look at it again. It said the death that he died, talking about Jesus, he died to sin once for all. And the life he lives, he lives to God. Death and resurrection. Spiritual lenses. I want you to read this with me right, uh, right from the screen, nice and strong. Ready, go. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. So it's the death and resurrection of Jesus placed before you like lenses to put on so you can see clearly. And I want you to see clearly so that you can live well. If you don't understand the reality of sin or see it clearly, and if you don't comprehend the power of resurrection and live in it rightly, you're not going to live well. You might skid across the finish line and and make it into heaven. But God has a life for you to live. A life marked by increasing measure of freedom from sin and increasing degree of the power of the Holy Spirit lifting you up and giving you hope. And so I want you today to decide, this is the kind of person I want to be. This is the kind of woman or man I want to be. Someone who lives my life through the the lenses of faith in the Lord Jesus. And so this is the declaration I want to invite you to make today. I live my life with lenses of faith in the Lord. Real simple. Just say it with me one time. I live my life with lenses of faith in the Lord. Faith in the Lord, in his death and in his resurrection. And so I, I I want to take you into a few scriptures today, and I want you to see clearly the reality of the need for the death and resurrection of Jesus. One thing that happens when you you put on these lenses and you you read something like what we just did, Romans 6.10, the death he died, he died to sin once for all. When you have lenses of faith in the Lord in your life, you can see that word sin and it makes sense to you. You you can see it clearly for what it is. It's not this crazy word that, ah, it's just for somebody fanatical out there. No, you, you can see sin for what it is. You can see sin as the destroyer and separator that it actually is. And you can come to a clarity about that. And it allows you to to recognize, no, this is not an issue of God trying to keep me from having my fun. This is an issue of my heavenly father wanting me to live well. And so I see clearly sin for what it is, a separator and a destroyer. And I I see clearly the gap between who I am and where I am. And I begin to recognize that sin is an orientation of selfishness and rebellion to God, defiance of God. Like without the lenses of faith, it doesn't look like there's any problem. It just looks like, well, I just feel like I want to do that stuff. And it just feels like it's going to be a lot of fun. And I just feel like it'll feel real pleasurable for me. And I feel like I want to do more of it. So bring it on. And the world around us says, yeah, that's right. You do you. You go get yours. Have all the fun you want. Smoke whatever you want. Drink whatever you want. Have sex with whoever you want. Wait, just, don't, just don't try to kill anybody. Right? I mean, like, that, that's the kind of ethos 
of the world around us regarding sin. But the sin nature, the orientation of sin is to say, I defy God. I defy God. Who's God? Who's, who's anybody to say what I should or shouldn't do? I'll say what I should or shouldn't do. I'll determine what's right and what isn't right. But the lenses of faith allow you to see things clearly and go, ah, it, sin is a destroyer and a separator. And my God wants me to live well. And so he's allowing me to see that for what it is and my need for God. Because I, I recognize that God is speaking, I can receive what he's saying. So Romans 3, 23, 23 and 24, it says this, all have fallen short of the glory of God. This is Romans 3, 23 and 24. Uh, why don't you read it with me? Ready, go. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. This one verse is super important. How many of you are, are Christians? Raise your hand if you would say, I'm a Christian. I know I am. Okay, so for if you are a Christian, you should know two of the words that are used in this verse. Two of the words that are used in this verse are incredibly important, and they are the words justified and the word redemption. There's like te top 10 theological terms, and these are two of them. So I want you to know them. I want you to not be afraid of them, and I want you to understand the impact and the meaning of these particular words so that you will know who you are. So uh, one more time, verse 24, just verse 24, just verse 24. Say it again out loud with me. Ready, go. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So the first part said, all have sinned. And so we're talking about once for all. That all includes you and me. Sin, apart from Jesus, that's what we got, is our sin. And we don't want to stay that way. And God doesn't want us to stay that way. So he provides something. And the something is listed right here. All are freely justified. Someone say freely justified. <laughs> freely justified. As it, first of all, it's free. You don't do something to earn it or deserve it. It is freely given to you. Freely justified. Shout that word again, justified. justified. I want you to know this word, justified. It, it has a particular meaning, and it, it, it's this. Justified means to render, show, regard, or declare as innocent. It's a legal terminology in its usage around 2,000 years ago in the culture in which the Bible was written. I'm going to say it again, to justify, to render, show, or regard, or declare as innocent. Do you know that's what Jesus does for you? Like, like he renders you, declares you, regards you, and shows you as innocent. But here's the thing, I, I don't know about you, but I have a little problem, which is sometimes I'll read through the Bible, like I'll read one of the Psalms where it says, I am innocent, O God, and I'll go, mm, I don't know, I don't know if that applies, I'm pretty sure that doesn't actually apply to me. Am I the only one who, who might feel that way? Like, I don't know if innocent is a word that actually applies to me. I mean, if it, if it were to mean perfect Morality, never missing anything, right? I, then I'd have to be honest and say, I don't think I get there. But, but my God, through his word, says that through Jesus, I'm freely justified. Presented, regarded, shown as innocent. It's like this. It's like you're standing in the throne room of the judge of the universe. And Jesus, it's as, it's as though Jesus is saying, yep, I know all about her. I know all about the things she's done that she shouldn't have done. I know all about the things that she did that she shouldn't do and that she hasn't done that she should do. I know all about the things that she thinks that she shouldn't. And, and, and nevertheless, Father, look at me. See her through me. See her through my nail-pierced hands. The price has been paid. Somebody say it. The price has been paid. Yeah. And so when the scripture says all are freely justified, you need to know that that applies to you. I, I do think it's holy and good to recognize all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned, and that includes me. But the next part of this verse is incredibly important if you're a believer, to know the gospel, to know I've been freely justified. Come on, somebody say it. I've been freely justified. 
freely justified. Justified to show or regard as innocent. He's done it for you. Justified. Somebody say, I'm justified. I'm justified. Say it again, I'm justified. Like you should actually smile about it while you say it. I'm justified. I've been demonstrated, shown as innocent. And then the second part of the verse is, are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Somebody say redemption. Redemption Redemption is about value. Value. My first experience with the word redemption uh, happened with a soda can. Like being a kid, and there's a little word on the top of that soda can printed into the metal. It said redemption value. At least it used to. I don't know if it still does, but redemption value, five cents. And as a kid, I remember being on roller skates and my dad would drive down the road and we would be on roller skates and picking up soda cans from the side of the road and putting them in the back of the station wagon. Why? Because it said redemption. It means it had value. We could take those soda cans, turn them in and get money. It was a good deal. And that was my first experience with the word redemption, to know that it is about value, that something that would otherwise be regarded as trash actually is valuable. But it's more than that. The the word redemption, to redeem, the biblical use of this word means to effect a liberation by payment of a ransom. Let me say it again. To effect a liberation by payment of a ransom. That's what it means, redemption. To effect liberation by payment of a a ransom. It's like as though you were kidnapped and held as a prisoner of sin. Oh, without the lenses, you didn't see it that way. You didn't regard it that way. You were like, oh no, I'm just over here having a good time. Just doing all the stuff that makes me feel so good. That's all. No, you were, you, were, you were held as a prisoner of sin. And what you didn't know is how much destruction it was actually gonna begin to wreak in your life. And the ultimate destruction beyond this life. And, and so, so, so he did what needed to be done so that you could be freely justified and redeemed. Because he saw your value and he determined, I want that valuable daughter, that valuable son to be brought out of that trap of sin and they are being held for ransom. You were in a sense being held for ransom and it was as though the devil is over here saying, I'm not letting her go. I'm not letting them go. A life for a life. And it's as though God said life for life, but I'm not only going to do it for just this one. I'm going to do it for all. And so he gave his own life. So that the perfection price could be rendered complete. So that you could actually be totally redeemed. I'm redeemed. I want you to just say it. I'm redeemed. You say it again. I'm redeemed. I am justified and I'm redeemed. I'm regarded and shown as innocent regardless of whether I feel that way or not. Isn't that good news for somebody? <laughs> I'm justified and I'm redeemed. Would you say it again? I'm justified. I'm, justified. I'm redeemed. Why don't you try one more time? Just say it. I'm, I'm justified. I'm, I'm I'm, this is the truth about you. It's the truth about you, and it's the truth of the gospel and what Jesus has done for you. These are the lenses. And so my determination is I live my life with lenses of faith in the Lord. That's the declaration of this message. Would you just say it one more time? I live my life with lenses of faith in the Lord. Okay, here's what I want to do right now. Is I want to, uh, to chase down what we began a couple of weeks ago on Easter Sunday. So Easter Sunday, we open up the Bible to Matthew 28. And I'm going to ask you to open up the Bible to Matthew 28 again today. And so take out the scriptures, open up your Bible app, whatever it's going to be, to Matthew chapter 28. So on Easter Sunday, we we looked at the first 10 verses where the, the, the women, Mary and Mary, they came to the tomb. It was empty. The angel said, he's not here. He's risen. And then they, they run to tell the disciples what had happened. And along the way, they, they see the risen Jesus. And he says to them, I am risen. Go to Galilee and tell the other disciples to go to Galilee. It's like Jesus is saying, we're going to have a little powwow. We're going to have a little meeting up in in Galilee. So get there. And and then for the next 40 days or so, Jesus appeared in in different ways to different people. But then the moment in Galilee happens. Wouldn't you want to know? I mean, if the risen Jesus says, go to Galilee, wouldn't you want to know what happens there? Yeah, so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to jump back into Matthew 28. And, and follow this up. So verse 11, it says, as the women 
were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priests what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, you must say Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and he stole the body. And if the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So if the guards accepted the bribe and said that they were told to say, and their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today. I'm going to pause there for a moment. I want to acknowledge something. Like, where it says that story spread among the Jews, I want you to keep this in mind. There was a much larger group of Jews that said, our Messiah has come. And I'm always going to be grateful for all eternity that there were a whole group of of Jewish believers that, that said, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the promised Messiah. And so, yes, there's a group of Jewish people there that said, no, 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 we're going to tell this story about how it's not, it's not true. But there's a much larger group of Jewish men and women in that city that said, no, this is the message of the promised Messiah, and we have seen him, and we know him. They carried that message for you and me. The fact that you and me are able to stand here today and say, I am justified, I'm redeemed. You know why we get to say that? Because a whole group of Jewish people said, our promised Messiah has come, and it's Jesus. And that's why we get this privilege of standing in this grace that we stand in today. So when when I say something to the effect of, oh, man, we need to be praying for the the peace uh, that's needed in the Middle East, you you should, with a heart of, of recognition that some of those believers there have descendants still in the land, you know? We're praying for them, and with grateful hearts. But I want you to recognize, too, it said that those Roman soldiers that were, in effect, uh, representative of the government said, let's make up a story, and let's tell this story, and get people to spread this story. And the intent of the story was what? To keep people from believing in Jesus. Do you think anything like that may still happen in any way? I mean, it's a tale as old as time, and ultimately its origin is in the devil himself, who the the Bible said is the God of this age who is there to blind the minds of unbelievers. And, And there are many stories still being told, just like it says, different kinds of stories, stories intent on dissuading you from trusting Jesus, stories sent to distract you, stories of whatever kind, even right down to literally literally stories, right? <laughs> you can press on and watch a nine-second story. Do you see what I'm saying? Like that, that issue of, of stories that are aimed at getting you distracted from Jesus, dissuading you from living a life of faith in the Lord Jesus, that is not new. That is, it's, it's here and it continues through history. But you, if you're a believer, you should be on the lookout for it. You should be able to distinguish between those kinds of stories that serve to distract you and dissuade you from your faith in Jesus and the truth of the gospel. So why am I spending 20 minutes today talking about justified redemption and asking you to say those words? Because I want you to know what's been done for you. I want you to build your life on the truth of the gospel and not on some false story that the world would send your way. It matters too much what Jesus has done. It's too good for you to not make the most of. So back, back to Matthew 28. So verse 16 and 17, it said, when the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. Verse 17, one more time, it said, when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some Doubt it. Doesn't, doesn't that kind of pique your interest a little bit? To hear that among the actual 12 disciples, that there were some who doubted? And we don't know, was it Bartholomew? Was it Matthew? Was it Levi? Was it Peter? Like, who, who could it have been? We don't even know. We're not given that detail, but we get the headline. And it's important. I want you to see this. I think it's really important that you can see that even among the core of the leadership of what we would call the early church, there were a bunch of people that just had their doubts. It's it's actually kind of helpful to see it, isn't it? It just says that some worshiped him and some doubted. 
I'm guessing that in this room right now, this group of believers, there are some ready to worship him and some of us who are doubting. It's important to see it, that in the earliest community, there was some kind of a place for the ones that, that hadn't quite figured it out yet, that weren't quite sure just yet, that were a little bit uncertain about this, that, that weren't, uh, were still wondering about things, that were maybe still working on how, how are these pieces going to fit together or not, and I have some questions. I'm, I'm uncertain, and, and I want you to just allow let that moment in the Bible to be present before you, that there is a place for, for doubt, <laughs> even among a, a group of fiery, passionate believers. Because on one level, doubt allows you to move beyond a superficial kind of a, a belief and to a deeper place. And which do you think would honor Jesus more? A superficial, haven't thought much about it, but I just believe, versus I've done the digging. I've asked the questions. I've wrestled with things. I've found real answers. I've been mentored. I got a disciple maker to make a disciple out of me to help me understand the things that I've been struggling with and wrestling with. Doubt can become the springboard to a deeper faith if you let it. And so I just want to say that's something in the scriptural story, part of Easter, if you will. And and so if you find yourself going, man, I don't know sometimes, though. Sometimes I'm just not quite sure. I'm a little bit uncertain. I have questions. I'm wondering about things. You're in good company. But but here's what I would say about what doubt is. In the Bible, there are actually uh, seven different words that are rendered in the one English word doubt. What that tells me is we should probably do a little bit of deeper digging. What is, it, what is it that is being communicated in this instance where it says some doubted? So here, in this instance, the word that's used, let me just break it down a little bit, right? It's this word, and I'll do this one because I think you can make the connection. It's the word distazo. And so stazo, we get our word stasis from, stability from. Like it comes from that origin. And then dis is like, you could probably figure it out. Divide. It's two. And so, uh, something's not working right. Thank you. So, it means literally to be standing in two places. To, to, be, to be standing in the place of, no, I don't really think that, uh, that this Jesus, I'm not sure about this Jesus thing. I mean, He's a good teacher, but I don't know about worshiping him. Uh, you know, Jesus is a, a good moral figure, but to really live a life uh, built on trusting him, I'm not so sure about that. Going to church once in a while, like Christmas or Easter, yeah, maybe, but, but like every week? Getting up close and personal with these other people? I don't know about that. To stand in that place and then to stand in a different place, which is, He is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He has taken away my sin through his sacrificial death on the cross, and he's really alive. And I honor him as the risen King and the risen Savior. Now, that that, that is standing in two places, and you can see how that's not going to work for very long. In this case, the purpose of the doubts is to urge you, to nudge you to a place of saying, I need to work on, I need to work through the things I'm wondering about. I need to dig deeper and make some discoveries about what I'm wondering about, to come to a place of clarity in my pursuit of understanding of a life with Jesus. And so now i got to complete the the scripture here. It says in Matthew 28, 18, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we identified in this once for all scenario that that the all includes us, because all have sinned, but then all are freely justified through the redemption that's available in Christ. Everyone say all. I'm part of the all. (laughs) Every single one of us. I'm part of the all, and I'm grateful. And now we come to a different all that is 
just as important. And it's the all spoken by Jesus in Matthew 28. He says, first of all, I'm going to read this text one more time, verses 18 to 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. So the first one is Jesus saying, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Your Savior Jesus, when he conquered death, received all authority. All authority. So what does that mean and what does it mean for you? Well, first of all, what does it mean? He has been given all authority. Authority over every demonic force, every curse, every spell, every hex, every witchcraft assignment, every affliction of one kind or another, every uh, malady and, and sickness, every inadequacy, every power of hell, every effect of the curse and the fall, and even victory and authority over hell itself and even death. All authority has been given to him. Ah, what does that mean for you? Well, what we read in the scriptures in the New Testament is that Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you, the one who has all authority, is in you. And that means something. It means that you actually get to move in and live in that same authority. Authority over the schemes and temptations of the devil. Authority over the pit of the trap of sin. Authority over the demonic assignments that have been sent against you. You are not the victim. You are the victor because the victor lives in you. All authority. Somebody say all authority. I, I want you, if you're a believer, to rise up into this. To realize, I, I, I am filled with the one to whom all authority has been given. I don't walk around on planet earth as a victim. None of us do. In Jesus, we are, we are in, infilled with his, his own spirit, the one who has authority over everything. It's just a matter of, would you line up with that? And, and would you allow yourself to stay more in step with the spirit in regard to that? And to find yourself walking in more of the victory that comes through that. Okay, all authority. And then he said, disciple, make disciples of all the nations. All the nations. And this is not talking about some UN program or something. This is all of the people groups on planet Earth. That's what that means. So Jesus, standing in one particular place called Bethany in the, in the Middle East, says, it's not just for here. All the nations, like all the people groups of the entire Earth need to know that they can be justified and redeemed. I want everybody to get a chance to know that. And, and it's, it's so fun to actually be a part of that stuff. I mean, I've spent a few years of my life living in different countries, getting to share about Jesus with people. And it's, it's been hard, and there's been moments where it was difficult, and there's persecution and all that, but there's also such joy in seeing the lights come on for somebody to recognize, wait a minute, I can really be forgiven? I can really have the, the power of God to lift me out of this pit? I can actually live with the Holy Spirit? I can actually begin to hear God's voice and live with a victory over the sinful inclinations that had bound me for so long? It's amazing to be a part of how that happens. So Jesus said, right, make disciples of all nations. And then we might think, okay, that's great. I, I, I'll pick the nations that I like. Like me personally, I, I went to Denmark and when I got off the plane and went into Copenhagen, I was like, everybody looks just like me. <laughs> These are my people. I'd love to share the gospel with them. You know? But I'll tell you what, I, I've lived in communist countries where, where the people did not look like me and the, the way they were thinking definitely was not like me. But Jesus wants for them to get his gospel goodness too. And, and even right up close here at home, like there's a lot of people that you're going to bump into that do not see things like you do. They watch a different news channel than you do. They, they put a different uh, color on. If they were picking colors, it would be a different color than yours. But Jesus might want for you to be the one that shares about his good news with them. So I, I wonder, Christian, if you could take this seriously, Jesus saying, I want you to go into all the nations and make disciples. And what if I were to ask you this question? Who is somebody that is a disciple of yours? 
Would you have an answer? Is there someone that you could say, yep, this is somebody who I've been, I've been sharing about Jesus with them, you know, helping them understand what the Bible says? And, because if that's not happening, then that would be the challenge. Sometime soon, like find a way to begin to step that up in your life. Will it be a little bit awkward at first? Probably. Could it lead to something beautiful and life-changing? Would you feel a thrill of the Holy Spirit working through you to help somebody else get free and come to know more of his goodness and power and love? Absolutely. And so I want you to hear this and take it personal today. Jesus telling you, I want you to disciple all nations. And yeah, somebody up the street, somebody around here. And he said, teach them to obey all my commands. Teach them to obey all my commands. How many of us could say, yeah, personally, I obey every single one of Jesus' commands already. I do that. Probably not too many of us. Most of us, if we're honest, would have to acknowledge, you know, I have a ways to go. But, but are you working in that direction? And, and could you imagine helping someone else to begin to move in that direction too? A direction that would honor Jesus and, and be about obedience to what he has commanded. So, so Romans 4.25 says this. It says, he was handed over to die because of our sins, but he was raised to life. Say the last part with me to make us right with God. The resurrection of Jesus makes it possible for this to be your reality. He, he, in his resurrection, makes you right with God. And so you, you need to think about the power of the resurrection sometime and let a little bit of wonder rise up in you. Let a little bit of gratitude rise up in you. Let a little bit of a shout of praise rise up in you because it is his resurrection ultimately that makes you right with God. He was handed over to die because of our sins, our sins, but he was raised to life to make us right with God. Remind yourself sometimes, I'm, I've been made right with God. Why don't you just say it? I've been made right with God. Just say it with me. I've been made right with God. And, and when, when you have that in your mind, I'm freely justified. I've been redeemed. Now, now we understand what those words are about, that, that, that there's been a, a way in which Jesus has demonstrated or shown or regarded and caused you to be regarded as innocent. That's justified. Redeemed is about the value that he saw in you and pulling you to a place where you are free from the, the trap of sin because the ransom was paid. I'm justified. I'm redeemed. And I'm part of his kingdom, making disciples. Okay, so Matthew 28 has Jesus giving this word of commission to the disciples. Go into all the nations, make disciples. But there's something that happens after this moment. And for whatever reason, Matthew didn't put it in his book. And when you read all of the Gospels, each of the Gospel writers show how they perceived what took place. And so Matthew gives us one thing, but Luke shows us what I would regard as the final moment. So what happens is Jesus, after his resurrection, he appears to the 11 disciples one, one moment on a, on a Galilee shore to cook them a fish breakfast. And then in another moment, he appears to two of the disciples as they're walking along a road to a place called Emmaus. And then he shows up to the 11 disciples another time in an upper room where he, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit and forgive as you've been forgiven. <laughs> I'm sending you. And then there's another moment where he appears to 500 of the disciples. So this is all happening over about a month and a half after what we call Easter. And then this moment happens this recorded in Luke 24. So if I were to cap off Easter, I'd have to go all the way here to Luke 24. And it says this, it says that after this moment where Jesus commissioned the disciples, it says, then Jesus led them to Bethany and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. And so they worshiped him and they returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy. And they spent all their time in the temple just praising God. <clears throat> I want you to recognize this. When you worship Jesus, it can bring great joy. <clears throat> so I hope that you'll see Jesus today. Can you grab me that water bottle, bro? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> so that eye doctor, <clears throat> when I walked into that office, it was a foreign place to me. I'd never really been in an eye doctor place before. I'm going to get the worship team to come on back out because I think I'm not going to be able to talk for too much longer. <laughs> um, and I walked into that, that eye doctor place. It was a foreign place. I felt very uncomfortable. I felt a little like I didn't know where I was. It was like behind one hallway, down another hallway, down another hallway. And, and then they, they you know, put my chin up on this machine. It was uncomfortable. And then there was this moment where the doc said to me, he said, well, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to dilate your pupils and then we're going to hit you with lasers. Okay. And I went, oh, yeah, yes, sure, sounds good. And then he walked out of the room. And after he walked out of the room, I found myself wondering, what in the world does that mean? What does it mean he's going to hit me with lasers? I like, never had this experience before. And, and so they did the drop. Some of you know what this is like. I'd never experienced anything like this except for back in my before Christ days, let's just say. So oh I, they dilated my pupils and hooked me up to this device, and they shot me with lasers. And all I knew was I was looking at a little green neon star. And then after it was done, everywhere I looked, that neon star was like in front of me everywhere, everywhere I went. And they said, oh, you know, are, did you drive here? And I said, yeah. And they said, do you think you're going to be okay? I'm like, I think so. I was not okay. They should have taken my keys away. Like everywhere I looked, it was like every single light looked like something from Las Vegas, just like br brilliant, shining, dazzling. It, it, it was crazy. But I want, I want you to think about this. When, when you put on the lenses of faith in the Lord Jesus, it's a little bit like that. Like you, you begin to see things in a different way, in a way that brings a dazzling kind of a brightness. And I'm praying for you that God would awaken that in you. And, and I'm praying for somebody who is a believer today. That, that you would step back to the place where you live in the reality that you know I'm justified. I'm redeemed. And that you live in that reality with a heart of joy, worshiping Jesus. I'm praying for you that you would come to a place where your heart wakes up within you to the reality that you need that. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to forgive your sin and save your life, that's what you're here for today, to start a relationship with Jesus so that you can know I am justified, shown, regarded, is innocent. I'm redeemed. My God sees the value in me enough to pull me out of the trap of sin by paying the ransom. God wants that for every single one of us, to live with the strength and the confidence that comes from knowing I'm justified. I'm redeemed. Devil, you can't have me because he already got me. So let's take a moment and just pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the life that's in your word. Thank you, God, for giving us clarity to know just exactly what happened. Jesus, when you died and when you rose again. Thank you that it's more than just a story or a tale of something that happened, like we sing, on a hill far away. But it's, it, it's earth shattering for all eternity in what it means. Because what it means is I, I'm justified. I, I'm regarded and shown as innocent. I'm redeemed. The ransom has been paid for me to be pulled out of the trap of sin. So Lord, I pray for somebody right now who's a believer, but who somehow, uh, you, you're here in church and this is good, but you've somehow allowed yourself to drift back into sin. And Jesus has already paid the price, the ransom price, for you to be able to be free from the power of sin. And I'm praying that even now in this moment, that for somebody, this would be the moment where you finally agree with heaven, that there is a way for you to live free from that sin. It's time. It's time for you to say, Jesus, help me. And I believe that as you just cry out, Jesus, help me. He hears the cry of faith. He hears it. And he'll come through. It's what he does. So Lord, I pray that you do a spiritual awakening for somebody else today too that just needs to once and for all say, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Would you forgive my sin and save my life? If you're sitting here today and you are a believer, 
you're a believer. You've, you've, you've asked Jesus to forgive your sin and save you. Maybe it's a while ago now, but you've found yourself kind of drifting back into a place of, of sin. You've just gotten into some stuff and you feel like you're almost stuck again. I mean, everybody's kind of eyes are closed and whatnot and praying, but if, the, if you're struggling, you're a believer already, but you're struggling with sin that you've gotten yourself back into and you want to ask him to help you, would you just raise your hand with me just as a way of saying, yes, I'll admit it. I need him to help me. There's a bunch of us and I'm proud of you for having the humility to acknowledge it rather than play religious games and try to cover it up. And there's probably some others of us, we just don't want to raise our hand because we don't want somebody next to us asking us questions. But Lord, for those of us who have a hand raised, we're crying out, help, Lord. Help, Lord. We don't want to stay stuck in that sin. We, we don't want to stay stuck in something that you paid a price to get us out of. And so right now, with our hand raised, we're just saying, Lord Jesus, help me. Every voice together, join with some of us who are crying out and just say, Lord Jesus, help me. Lord Jesus, help me. Every voice, say it together. Lord Jesus, help me. Lord Jesus, help me to be free from the trap of sin that you paid the price to get me out of. You can put your hands down. And I'm proud of you for just acknowledging. Yep, there's stuff that's got a, got a grip on me that I don't, I don't need to have, it, have a grip on me anymore. And I believe that even from you crying out today, you are going to walk into freedom. He's going to give you a will to walk back into right, right ways of living by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Lord, I pray that you do the spiritual awakening for somebody that they need to just finally, once and for all, say yes to Jesus. And while we're sitting here together, if you don't know where you stand with God and you want to ask Jesus to forgive you and save you, you're ready. You're finally ready to say, I want to ask Jesus to forgive my sin and save my life. Right now, raise your hand with me. Just raise it up high as a way of finally saying, I want to ask Jesus to forgive me and save me. And keep your hand up for a moment. There's a, a few of you. Keep it up right there in the middle on my left. Thank you. In the back and the left, I see you. Excellent. Anyone else? Raise it high over here on the left, on my left. Thank you. Wonderful. With your hand raised in the back on the right, just take a moment right now and pray with me. You say something like this. You say, Jesus Christ, I believe in you. It all starts there. Would you just say that with me? Jesus Christ, I believe in you. I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of things I'm still trying to figure out, but I start right there. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. And just tell him, Jesus, I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Just say it to him. Jesus, I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Jesus, save me. Just tell him, Jesus, I give you my life. Just say it with me. Jesus, I give you my life. You're the Lord and the Savior of my life from this moment on. I believe that you're the Son of God and that you paid the price in full to take away my sin. And I believe that you conquered death and you're alive. So I'm asking you to come into my life and make me whole. Thank you, Lord, for new life. I receive it. Thank you, Lord. I want you to stand up together, church. Stand up together. And just, would you just acknowledge this for a moment? Just say, I'm justified. I'm redeemed. These are the lenses of faith. I'm justified. I'm redeemed. Because of what Jesus has done. He's my king. We pray that you are truly blessed by today's message. If you're looking for ways to get connected at Centerpoint, or you'd like to partner with us through your giving, go to mycenterpoint.tv today. Thanks for joining us at Centerpoint Church, where we are all about loving and leading people to a life-changing connection with Christ. Don't forget to subscribe and have a blessed day.